Hey everyone, how's it going? This is Jason from Stray Basilisk. We're trying something out new today, which is a kind of live development slash coding stream. I'm going to be working on, from scratch, working on a little kind of R&D or proof of concept for a, something for the Steamhounds project and kind of walking you through it uh, from scratch. So if you're not familiar with Steamhounds, Steamhounds is a turn-based tactical game where you command a mercenary crew in this kind of once great but now crumbling steampunk city. It's kind of a mix between a JRPG style game and a turn-based, uh, grid-based combat game. Uh, but what we're working on today is a kind of new feature and kind of exploring some possibilities for adding something new into the game. What this all revolves around is a kind of cool ink spill map effect. So to kind of explain the context and what this is all about. So right now there's a, there's a build of the game available which people can download and play. But this really only shows kind of single matches in isolation. And we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes on both the broader kind of multiplayer progression and also the single player campaign. And a big part of both of those is the idea of a city map, uh, which shows the territory of the various in-game factions and is kind of dynamic and changes over time in response to either what you're doing on your single player campaign or what all of the players in the community are doing in the kind of multiplayer part of the game. So our amazingly talented artist Briwick has put together some kind of mock-up sketches for what this city map uh, might look like. Um, I guess you get the picture, right? It's going to be a kind of map sitting on your desk with the kind of layout of the city drawn out there. And you can kind of get a sense here of having this idea of kind of city blocks and neighborhoods which are owned by different factions and having some way to kind of indicate which faction owns which bit of territory at any given point in time and to be able to kind of represent that in a cool visual way. So we explored a few different alternatives for this. And one thing which we're really leaning towards and we think seems pretty interesting is the concept of a using ink spills to represent the territory of the various factions. So this is a mock-up which uh, Briarwick did for us. I think probably spilling some real ink on pages to kind of uh, figure out how this kind of should look. She also put together some other kind of examples like this which we can take a look at. So this is just a really cool, like visually interesting effect. And it also already has a kind of map like quality, right? Like this could be a, a coastline or like a mountain range or something. I think it works quite well to indicate the borders between uh, different territories. You also get this interesting effect where um, two of these colors kind of butt up against each other. Uh, and the way the paint interacts get, get this cool kind of blending and this cool kind of fringy border which kind of visually represents the, you know, the turmoil and the conflict as people are fighting over this territory along these borders. But I think it really fits, and it really fits in with the, with the kind of visual aesthetic. I'll show you another kind of mock-up. Here's an idea of what a piece of the map might look like. And we're going to be looking to kind of overlay these colors to kind of, you know, you could imagine this broken up into little territory blocks and areas and have these kind of colored differently in a smooth kind of dynamic looking way based on the territory. So what we're going to try and do today, kind of from scratch, is to reproduce this kind of visual effect in a kind of dynamically so that we can overlay this over a map and have it fill in the territories however we however we like and have it generate a somewhat realistic realistic looking ink effect kind of over the top of that. So what I'm the tool I'm going to be using to do this today is something called uh, processing. Um, so this is kind of like an R and D proof of concept project. So really, I could use whatever. You know, there's any number of tools I could use to do this. I could write a shader or write some code in some other language or framework. But I like processing because it's pretty much the quickest way I know of to get start fiddling around with pixels and images and get stuff on the screen like super quickly. So if you're interested in looking into this yourself, you can get it for free from processing.org. It, it's built on top of uh, Java, but it's kind of specifically tailored to artists and people doing creative visual stuff. So it kind of really fits with this like visual concepting and prototyping stuff that we're doing. Okay, so I suppose the question is how do we try and replicate this effect in code, right? So the first thing I notice is there, that there are kind of distinct areas in here, right? Um, so there's kind of a dense like middle core which is actually fairly uniformly like softly shaded in and then we have this kind of fringy border which is where stuff gets really textured and interesting and then we also have this kind of blending 
uh, between different layers here. So thinking about how we might kind of try and replicate this. Um, so I've got a piece of blank map which gonna, we're going to kind of use as our canvas for this today. My thought about how we would do this is we want kind of like a soft fill for this middle section, right? It should be easy enough for us to kind of generate something like this, like a soft fill in the middle. Obviously this kind of totally obscures what's beneath it, so we can play with blending modes maybe to get this to look more realistic. My instinct is to go with multiply because I think that's how paint works. Yeah, that kind of looks like a stain on the page, right? Um, but then the slightly more tricky bit perhaps is how we create these textured fringy edges. And I think the approach I'm going to take is to use an actual image of an ink spill and kind of sample it and use it as a like a brush or a stamp to kind of place somewhat randomly around these edges and I think that might be able to kind of replicate that that texture for us. So like going back to some of these examples I really like this one as a really good representative example of what these kind of watercolor inky spills look like. Okay here we go. What I thought is okay can we just take this uh, first of all, let's try and make it the same color as the other kind of ink we were working with. Let's colorize this to that with the yellowy orangey color. I think if I just take this and try and copy and paste it kind of around the edge here. Whoa, okay. Okay, this image is super, super big. It's like way out of scale. So let me try and work out an appropriate scale for this thing. Maybe something like around 50 pixels across, something like that. So if I scale this whole thing down, like 100 by 100. Maybe we'll be in a better shape here. Okay, paste this in. Uh... Also probably should sort out the blend mode here and also use the multiply blend. Kind of what I'm thinking is that we drop this down, we kind of duplicate it and place it around maybe with some randomness kind of all around the border and hopefully get this kind of textured fringy edge effect. I think this is promising, like it's there's a couple of things that immediately stand out as potential problems. First of all, these are all look kind of exactly the same and super uniform. So maybe one thing we could try is we like randomly rotate this around slightly. We would break up some of that uniformness, uniformity, whatever the word is, and have it look a bit more organic. And then with a bit of jittering around of the positions, maybe we can make something that works out. So, it's kind of ugly and rough right now, but this is the kind of general approach I'm going to try and recreate in code. So speaking of code, shall we maybe jump straight into it? So if, you, if you're not familiar with processing, the way that this works is... Um, the main kind of entry point is it allows you to define two functions, one called setup, which runs right at the start of the program, and another one called draw, which runs like once for every frame. So the first thing I need to do is to load my kind of background map image in here. Uh, and the way you load stuff in uh, to a processing project is you shove it in a folder called data, and I've kind of already pre-prepared this here in a file called background.png. So we want to load that. I create a variable here to store this image once it's loaded. And processing, these are called the image variables. And it comes with a load image function. And just specify background.png like that. Uh, and then in the draw function, oh, another thing I should do in setup is actually kind of define the size of the window. So we've reused the size function to do that, and I'm just going to make it the same size as this image, which is 900 by 800 pixels. If I run this right now, get a 900 by 800 window here. We're not drawing anything into it yet. 
Uh, to do that, we want to image function for this background image, and I'm going to draw it kind of starting at the top left corner to hopefully fill the window. Okay, that's a good start. Um, so the next thing is for us to work out, and maybe I'll draw a diagram to kind of work through this step by step. So we have our map, right? We have a bit of territory that we're that we're interested in with some kind of shape. And what I kind of want to do is to draw our, uh, our kind of border segments kind of somewhat regularly with some kind of randomness around the outside here. And then to draw another image, maybe like a softer kind of brush kind of variation of this, more like uniformly kind of throughout the center to kind of give it that soft fill effect. I think I'll start with this in a bit because it seems a bit simpler to do. One thing I will need is a kind of soft fill brush, which doesn't have quite so much texture like this. So I'm going to make a new image, call it 64 by 64 pixels. I'm going to do this in white because I'm going to apply all the tinting and colouring later on in the code. I feel like that should be more flexible. Just drop the spot there right into the middle. I'm going to save it into our data folder here. I call it brush. I'm going to call this the mid brush for like the soft middle uh, brush part. And now I need to load this in as well, right? So brush, brush. Ah, can't type today. So this is very much a trial run, I should say, and I'm still getting used to the setup. Like I'm thinking about streaming these. This is actually kind of pre-recorded, as I'm just kind of uh, testing out the format and seeing how this goes. So what I kind of want to do conceptually here is for each location inside the territory I want to, you know, draw my my mid brush at that location. So the question is how do I determine which uh, which pixels of the overall image are within the bit of territory that I'm trying to draw. So I could get kind of fancy with this and try and define, uh, you know, define this shape here using lines and geometry and some sort of calculation to figure out if a given point is inside this, this polygon or not. What I'm actually going to do is something a bit more hacky and cheap, which is to create a mask image, which kind of just provides this for me. So with a white brush, all I'm going to do is fill in my image editor, this whole area. And I'm just going to export this as mask T1 for territory one. Ultimately, I want to start playing around with the neighboring territories and how these kind of blend and merge into each other and stuff. But for now, let's just focus on drawing one one of these blobs. Put this in now. Is that what I called it? I hope so. Yep, there we go. So what I'm going to do essentially to kind of implement this this concept here is that I'm going to loop through every pixel in the entire image. So, sign of x equals zero, all the way up to the width. So, this is now effectively iterating through every pixel in the image. Now what I need to do is 
kind of do a look up into this image to see if the pixel's white or not. Um, so I happen to know that in order to access the kind of raw pixel data of an image in processing, I need to use a function called... Actually, let's check the documentation to make sure I'm exactly right about this. Okay, yeah, so there's a function called load pixels. Say this works as you have an image loaded. Okay, this isn't quite right. This is a way to access the pixels on the kind of display itself. I'm interested more in accessing the pixels of an individual image. Let's dig into the documentation a bit more. Oh. Misclick there. Okay, here we go. So I call the load image function, load pixels function on the image, and then I can access this pixels array to kind of get raw access to the pixels there. So that's what I want, I think. So I think the reason this is necessary is because the actual pixel data is shunted off to the graphics card to deal with, and it's not really kept in memory where it can be easily accessed. So load pixels probably pulls that out and it puts it in kind of an array where you can just get to it directly. When you do load pixels, you should then let it know that you're done fiddling with the pixels at the end of it. Okay. And now I need to kind of read the value out of the pixel. If you look at our mask image, it's kind of a transparent image. So I'm actually, I said I drew this in white here. I'm actually just going to check the alpha value. So transparent, fully transparent is going to be alpha of zero and opaque is going to be alpha of 255. And I'm just going to say, if the alpha for a pixel is greater than zero, then we'll consider it to be part of this territory. Okay, so here's, here's an issue. How do we actually look up a particular XY pixel in this? Because we just have a one dimensional array here. So, back to the drawing board perhaps. So generally the way an image is stored in a computer's memory is kind of as a grid of pixels, as you might expect. So conceptually we have this 2D grid, but as we've seen, this pixels array is actually just a kind of 1D thing. So the way it really works is that this row is really just kind of tacked onto the end of this one, so it all kind of continues off in a single thing like that. And the way these are indexed or numbered is that this is pixel 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and it just kind of wraps around like this, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the question is, given an x and y coordinate, how do we know the index of that pixel kind of within this array? So we can tell that as x increases, that index just goes up, right? So if the if it's y is 0 and x is 3, then it's this pixel here, and its index is just 3. But every time we go down a row, every time y increases by 1, we actually step up by 5, right? So this image is 5 pixels wide, and... In the x equals zero column, we go from like zero, five, 10, 15, and so on. It turns out that the, the kind of formula you need to derive the pixels index from its x and y is x plus y times width. This is a super common thing, which you often see in any kind of image processing application. Yep, so I'm just gonna kind of plug that in here. So yeah, let me know in the comments, by the way, to what extent you want me to walk through this at like a super low level, right? Should I just go through at my own pace and kind of do some running commentary? Would you like me to kind of explain this kind of thing as I go or, or really take it slow and be kind of tutorial style? Let me know what you'd, what you'd prefer me to do there. Right, Processing gives us a handy function to 
Okay, and okay, there's another there's another issue here, which is that the red, green, blue, and alpha values of this pixel are kind of packed into this single integer. So we actually need to uh, you know, these are packed in in like a bitwise fashion. So a certain number of bits of this integer are allocated to red, some to green, some to blue, and some to alpha. Um, but processing gives us a handy kind of convenient set of functions to unpack those and pull those back out. Oh, interesting. Okay, actually gives us a float. That's interesting. Basically what I want to say is if... This is when we know that we are now... That this particular pixel is part of this particular bit of territory. So what we can do is we can pop down our mid brush at this point. Okay, let's take a look at what this looks like. I know this is actually going to be a hot mess, but we will we will fix this in the next couple of steps. Okay, there we go. So we've got something here. It's uh, managed to fill in that image for us. You notice it's, this looks kind of offset, actually. And I think the, the reason for that is that when we've drawn this image here, it actually draws the top left corner. So and going back to our little sketch, we have some bit of territory. And the first, you know, Tommy want to put the brush down here. You want to put it down at this point. Uh, but what it actually does is it draws that brush, brush image kind of anchored to the top left. But everything is kind of offset uh, to the kind of bottom and right. Uh, so we could do a bit of math to get this out, but processing actually gives us another handy function called rec mode, I believe. Which says, hey, don't draw it sort of anchored to the top left of the image. Instead, draw it anchored to the center. Okay, that's not quite working as I expected. Maybe it's image mode. Okay, cool. There we go. Oh, now something always happened. Okay. <laughs> the first time around it drew okay, but now it's drawn our background image, sort of again anchored to the center. So the center of that image is now in the top left, but we actually only want to draw our brushes centered and our background image we want to do of anchor to its corner as we'd expect. Okay, cool. We've now got kind of coverage of this area, which is nice. Now, one thing we noticed this is this is white and it's also super dense. What I think I will do is I will kind of specify a color up here. Make a nice tasteful color for this. I'm a fan of kind of plum purple, so go red is one eighty six and two ten. Let's also throw an alpha here. It's super super opaque, so let me try dropping that really low. So the way we apply a kind of color to an image is with this tint function. Okay, let's check how this looks now. Okay, better, better. <laughs> okay, we've got the same issue again where this tint is being carried over to the next run through draw and it's also tinting our background image, so we're getting a weird, weird effect there. So we want to just draw a background image at kind of full white at full alpha. Okay, nice, nice. So even though our alpha is what ten, this is still like super opaque. Let's try dropping the alpha even lower. Okay, yeah, 
interesting that we can't really see anything at all. I think part of the issue is that we're actually still drawing these brush strokes using a regular blending mode. So when we were playing around with our, uh, our thing here, we actually had a multiply blend on this layer. So we can actually replicate that in code as well. I believe the way we do that is blend mode multiply. And I'm not going to make the same mistake, same mistake again. I'm going to set my blend mode to normal before I draw the background. Because that Ooh, okay, this is super ugly. So, logically what's going on here? Okay, so, okay, I think what's happening is that we're effectively drawing our little, um, little blobs here. I put one in. We had, what, an alpha of like 10. Let me draw another one like immediately next to it. And another one immediately next to that. And these quickly begin to like layer and compound on top of each other. And then multiply and multiply and multiply. I feel like what we actually want to do is kind of draw all these into one layer in one go and then multiply that over the top of our background as a kind of second pass, if that makes sense. Um, and the way we do that in processing is to use something called a render target. Basically, we want to draw our color effect to a separate kind of off-screen texture and then draw that over our background all at once in a single operation with a kind of... and that'll make the blending work as we kind of hope and expect it to. So, processing how do we create a separate render target. Google time. Okay, looks like here's how we do it. We use this create graphics function. And then it gives us another kind of surface we can draw to. We can do a load of stuff in the separate texture and then we can finally kind of draw that to screen. So we use this create graphics function to do that. Cool. I'll we'll call this overlay, I think. Really what I kind of want to do here is play the overlay each time around, so a dot. And then instead of drawing directly to the screen here, I actually want to draw to the overlay. And then I'm going to draw the overlay on top of the screen. So the tinting now is happening all in one go. So the overlay will just kind of have like the black and white thing that we've made and then we'll kind of multiply that over in one go. In fact, now we don't really need this center thing. The overlay is the same size as the screen, so we draw it straight over. Just want to make sure that the overlay itself uses the centered mode. What's the problem here? Check that example again, I've probably done something stupid. Okay, so it looks like there's a begin and end draw function which we need to which we need to call before doing anything uh, fancy with this. So 
Hopefully it likes this better. Ooh, okay. You may not be able to see it here on the stream, but there's actually a very faint kind of pinky purple overlay here. And now I can maybe bump the alpha back up, maybe quite a lot. Cool, okay. So we're getting this kind of uh, this uh, middle area and it's kind of blended smoothly and we've got soft edges and it's not kind of obscuring the lines and stuff behind it, which is good. One thing that still bothers me is that, okay, let's go back to our reference images of some real ink. But these are not like totally uniform. And right now we're drawing this, uh, every single pixel, which is part of the territory, we're drawing this overlay. What we actually might want to consider is um, having a bit of random variation by only drawing it with a certain probability. So it's not like quite as insanely dense. The kind of cheap way to do that is just to use this random function. You can think in percentages. So maybe, you know, maybe only like a 10% chance that we actually draw this. It's also going to make things perform better because it's kind of unnecessary the density with which we're drawing this. Huh. And we're already seeing the kind of effect of this randomness as it draws this over and over each frame. We're getting some like slight variation. And this is kind of what we want, right? To get that natural inky effect. Maybe I can drop this down even more. No half measures, drop it down by a factor of 10. Ah, that's interesting. It's probably slightly too low, we're actually getting some voids in the middle, which I don't necessarily think we want, so maybe the sweet spot's somewhere in between. There. You also notice that when the density is low, the kind of circular shape of this brush starts to become more apparent, which again is probably not exactly what we want. So again nice so we're already getting that kind of um hand-drawn animation effect from this which is kind of nice but this is a good point to take a quick break for now so i'll be back in a few minutes and i'll be through this okay um we are back i'm gonna take a quick recap of what we're doing and where we are and then push on with this so our goal for today was to re recreate this kind of ink spill effect in order to show the territory in, on the Steamhounds world map in a dynamic way to kind of show which faction owns which territory and have this kind of evolve and change over the time in, in response to the player's actions kind of in the campaign and also in the multiplayer mode of the game. So the way that we approach this is that we started by taking a kind of soft brush type image. Essentially what we've, what we've done is that we've We've just kind of dropped that brush down regularly kind of throughout this territory. So we've kind of used a mask image to define which pixels are inside this territory and which are outside. And then we've kind of scanned through the whole image for each pixel. We've, with some sort of random variation, we've either dropped our brush image down there or we haven't. And that's created this kind of uh, dynamic moving kind of spill effect. So I'll kind of walk through the code again quickly and maybe throw some comments in here. Obviously I'm conspicuously missing comments. Sorry for the U in colour, I am. Um... British. Uh, it becomes incredibly annoying in programming because every programming language, of course, spells color without a U. So it, it's kind of corrupting my brain. So you often see these things referred to as render targets or off screen. Textures. Okay.
And what we're doing here is we're scanning through every pixel in the image. And then we're using this mask to determine whether this particular pixel is part of the territory or not. I'm using a kind of soft fill brush and then we have a 5% chance here. Let me just plop down our brush. This is kind of like clean up stuff that processing just makes us do because we've been fiddling with pixels and drawing to this off screen texture. And then this is where we actually draw the overlay on top with this multiply blend tinted to the, the color that we wanted for our territory. Okay, cool. That's kind of phase one done, right? We've got our our mid brush done, but I think things will maybe get a bit more complicated when we try to draw our, uh, our more textured brush around the edge, which is how we're going to try and get this more detailed, textured, fringy thing going on. So let's think about how we're going to approach this. I think at this point it's going to become necessary for us to define a set of lines or a polygon because we're drawing stuff kind of along these lines which defines this thing, like using a mask image is not really a great fit for this anymore I don't think. So I think the way I'll do this is by defining all of these sequence of points around the edge of this thing and that will imply a set of lines like this. Okay, so there's going to be a bit of boring data entry stuff. I kind of need to get these uh, coordinates into my processing sketch here. I think the way I'll do this is I'll create um, I'll create a list of Processing gives you this p vector, which is like an xyz coordinate. We only really care about x and y in this case, but I'm going to use it in any case. This is some very Java -y code. You kind of set up a list, and this is just like a flexibly sized list which we can throw stuff into quite conveniently. import this. Weirdly it seems like it had already imported array list but not standard list, which is kind of odd. Hope we don't have any errors here. Okay, still working. Now let's kind of populate our list with a set of points which represent these kind of nodes here around the edge. Of course, in the final game, this is not going to be some hard-coded list of points. There's going to be some config file or something which defines all of these territories and their boundaries. But hey, we're just again, we're just kind of doing a proof of concept R&D thing to see if we can actually create this effect and how it actually gets implemented and integrated into the game will, you know, be whatever's the best fit there. But I, I kind of want to prove to myself that this principle will work first. So let's just add some points in here. I don't remember how you initialize a vector in processing. So one of our coordinates here. And it doesn't need to be super accurate. So down here it's going to show the coordinates as I hover around 121 by 106. I don't care about Z, I'm just going to set it to zero. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six points. One. Six is by four by two three. You 
70 by 340-ish. Four two by three eight eight. And then one two two by three eight five. Oh, that's enough. Okay, I think to make sure we've got this right, the first thing I'll maybe do is just draw these points directly. circle at each point um, five by five thing okay might not, not, might not be able to see it super clearly but I can see these little circles down here and I want to think about the lines kind of connecting these I still make the It's a bit more visible for us. It's going to be debug drawing stuff, so maybe even create a little flag so we can toggle this on and off. So we've got the points that we wanted there. And then we kind of need to now turn this list of points into a set of lines, because as we're kind of walking along these, putting down our textured brush, we're kind of going to need to do these line by line. So if you think about how these points define a set of lines, uh, we have point zero here, point one, Point two, three, four, five, and zero one is a line. One two is a line. Two three is a line. Three four is a line. Four five is a line, and then five zero is also a line. I kind of want to consider these pair of points at a time and kind of loop through, loop through them in that way. So a way to do this is. first point of this line is the ith, the ith point if you like, and the second one the i plus one the point. And what we want to do is draw a line from e1.x, 1.y to e2.x, dot y. Anticipating this is probably going to throw an error, but we'll kind of figure out why in a second. Okay. Got an index out of bounds exception. So Java gives you this whenever um, you try and access an array or a list at you know, a value which doesn't exist in it. You know, you try and go read like entry minus one or entry six from this list. So in this case, we've tried to access entry six. And what's happened is once we got up to point five, it's tried to pair it with point six, which doesn't, you know, there is no point six. Actually, what all we want to do is pair it with. Uh, point zero. So one way to get around this is to could have a bit of conditional logic. We can also use modulus to do this for us. So so if you remember from high school maths how the modulus works, so it's kind of like a remainder operation, right? So if I do um, 3 mod 5, and the answer is just 3. If I do 6 mod 5, then the answer is 1. Or even if I do 5 mod 5, the answer is 
zero. So it kind of loops back around, right? Rather than continuing to count up, it will go zero, one, two, three, four, zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. So using this modulus, I kind of cause this to wrap back around to zero when it gets to that last point. Nice. So we've now got these lines right out here, which is kind of exactly what we wanted. Um, what I kind of want to do is give myself a way to toggle on and off this debug display. Um, so I kind of need to show you now how um, responding to the keyboard on mouse and stuff works in processing. So you can also define functions like key pressed. Weird autocorrect stuff there. I kind of want to say is if actually let me remind myself how processing does this. How do you work out which key it is? Code. Code equals equals up, for example. Actually, you know what, I think the way this works is kind of weird, but it compares it against the actual character. Yeah, I think that's how they work, processing. But what we kind of want to do here is toggle the debug draw variable whenever the spacebar is pressed. We use the old classic trick of debug draw is equal to not debug draw, or the inverse of debug draw, to toggle that. Now I can press space and toggle that debug draw on and off nice. Okay, so now let's get to placing our border brush around this edge. And the way I kind of want to do this is to kind of walk around this. Actually, I'm going to screenshot this. It's going to be useful for our mock-up. So if this is point zero, I'll, I'll enable that, I think. What I want to do is kind of walk all the way around this border and then kind of similarly to how I had a random chance to drop down this uh, mid brush with the border brush I'm going to do the same thing so you know we'll step across, step along at a certain rate and then at each point we'll randomly decide to draw the brush maybe we'll throw some other randomness in there like rotating or offsetting it slightly or scaling it or something like that Conceptually, I kind of just want to continue walking around this and consider it to be like a continuous uh, path, right? Where it actually gets kind of awkward to implement is these transitions from one line segment to another. So, let's get into some code and figure out how we're going to manage this. And now I'm going to quickly disable the drawing of the mid uh, thing because I feel like it's going to possibly kind of be distracting. How are we going to do this? I'm not going to be too worried about doing this in the most efficient way um, because yeah this is just a proof of concept performance is not really an issue so I'm going to take a kind of super naive brute force approach but hopefully this works so what I kind of want is a variable which shows my total progress of like walking around the border of this entire shape so let's start at zero and then I'm going to yeah, what I could do is work out the entire length of this perimeter and then do a loop which bails out when I reach that, but I think I'm going to use 
bit more dangerous, a wild through loop here, and then I'll, I'll break out when at some point I realize I've reached the end. But the way I'm thinking about this is what I'm going to do is, uh, for any given walk progress, let's say this is like 10, you know, or 100 pixels, uh, if my walk progress is 50, I'm going to look at the first line segment and say, hey, is 50 less than my length? If so, then I know that I'm like at some point along this line. If my walk progress was 150, then I'd kind of check this line. I'd say, okay, I'm, I've gone off the end of this. I need to move on to the next segment. And then I would kind of figure out, okay, I've now got another, if this is 100, I've still got 50 to account for, right? So my position is going to be like here somewhere. That's kind of the approach this little walking algorithm that I'm considering here. Um, I have this handy loop which kind of walks through each uh, line which kind of does exactly what I want. So I'm going to loop through these segments until I find the one which contains my current position if that makes sense. Uh, and then I'm going to increase or this walk progress variable to take my next step and then I'm going to calculate the whole thing again the next time around which is going to be super inefficient but honestly it should work just fine. Let's say premature optimization is the root of all evil or you know maybe I'm just lazy. So let's do something really obvious first like 20 or something which we can't you know we won't be able to miss. Now let's think about the length of this line right. wonder if there's a I'm gonna use some of processing's built-in vector stuff to this for me find the difference between these vectors find the magnitude of that. So the way this will work is it will consider these these two points, kind of find the vector between them. In this case it's going to be a horizontal. Let's consider this a bit more of an interesting case. Going between these, it's going to kind of subtract them to find the vector between them. And then it's just going to, the magnitude will just give me the length of this whole vector, which is the length of the segment that I'm currently on. Should work just fine. Now what do I want to do? I want to figure out if the, the point which I've walked to is inside this segment or not. So at this point I know that the point I've walked to is kind of inside this current segment here. I should realize something else here which is that when I get to the what happens if this isn't true right if I need to move on to the next segment what I kind of need to do is subtract the length of this current segment from you know the distance I've still got remaining so kind of working through this again if my distance is like 150 you know this is like 100 and this is 200 long and I'll look at this first segment, I'll say, hey, my the point I'm trying to walk to is 150, my length is 100. You know, is it within the segment? No, I need to move on to the next one, but then I need to kind of subtract the 100, because I know I've actually only got 50 remaining for the next segment to kind of account for. The way I'm going to do that is to create another variable. I copy this walk progress out and then if I'm not matched, you know,
Okay, will this do what I want? I think it just might be... Instead of drawing an actual brush here, I'm just going to put down a point because it will be easier for us to visually identify like the points that it's chosen. Okay, there's another issue here of like where exactly do we draw this uh, point, which I'll figure out in a second. Okay. So, in this situation, right, I know when we're considering this segment and I've got 50 left, and I know that the length of this segment is 200 here. Basically, I need to account for the fact that 50 is like a quarter of the way through this segment. So, in order to find out where that point is exactly, I would take the start point and then add 25% of this length to kind of work out where exactly my point lands. Uh, and I've got halfway here at this point, right, by finding the vector from uh, from one point to the other. I'm actually going to save this off. Uh, this is probably pointing backwards, so I probably actually want to subtract P2 from P1 to make sure the vector is going in the right direction. Already, I will say there's loads of optimizations I could make, like I'm doing magnitude, I could be comparing square magnitudes and not having to deal with square roots and stuff. If it runs super, super slow, I may make a couple of those optimizations, but if not, I mean, this is kind of going to get the job done. Also, I'm walking all the way through the path for every single point that I'm uh, trying to reach along this, like, the main walk, which is kind of redundant as well, but okay, no big issue there. I'm going to do to calculate this is take the start point, which is 1. I'm going to add that. the segment vector scaled by like how far along it we are. Um, Okay, I mean, when you write this much code in one go without running, it's almost never going to work first time, so let's see how close we got. Also, there's a while tree loop, so we need to make sure we actually exit at some point. Um, and I think that should happen. Yeah, so we're checking each segment here. It's possible that we just walk all the way off the end, right, into the, uh, the kind of next segment. So in fact, if we get through the end of this loop, so a boolean here. This point we can remember if we did actually find this point. And we can say at this point, if we found the point, I mean to continue stepping along our walk a little bit. Otherwise, We've completed the walk, right? Because we've uh, we've gone off the end of the off the last segment, basically. 
that's how we that's when we can finally get out of our endless while loop. Uh, we also want to break out of this for loop at this point once we've found that point. We don't want to consider any subsequent segments. Let's throw another break in here. Fingers crossed, let's see how this goes. Okay, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> I'm like pretty pleased with myself there. Um, so you've managed to draw these ex equidistant points all the way around this border here, which is which is pretty awesome. Okay. So now let's not just draw these little dots, let's actually draw the textured brushes which we were looking at. I think what I'm going to do here is try and turn this uh, into a brush. I think we're going to need to do some fancy stuff with the alpha channel here. See this? Let's play around with the. Okay, it's in there. It's in there. It's just kind of hard to see. Maybe that will do. Let's give it a go. I'm. It's a border brush. Load this brush now. We'll leave our mid brush off so we can focus on this particular thing that we're working on. Will that do everything we need? What's wrong here? Okay, okay, we've definitely got something here. Yeah, you can see this is like super uniform, kind of super obvious. So let's play around a bit and try and make this a bit more interesting. One thing we could do is try and maybe... Okay, let's, we've got a few magic numbers here like this 20, let's pull some of this stuff out into variables so we can play around with it a bit more. A bit more spacing there. Let's try also randomly offsetting the position slightly so they're not exactly on like super regular spacing around that. We call this like jitter maybe. I'll offset this by some randomness. There's more fancy ways we can do this. This is kind of randomness almost in a. Ooh, interesting. Ok, 
Okay, that's quite a lot. I mean, it kind of gives a sort of interesting outline. Maybe a slightly bigger brush texture would work. So we can tune this down slightly. I'll mid brush back on and see how the effect looks all together. I've just screenshotted that so we can take a look at it in more detail. It's a bit of texture right there, it still looks rather soft though I would say. Is there something we can do to make that a bit harder? If you remember the original image from this was like super um super large and we scaled it down and when we scaled it down I think we probably lost a lot of the uh the high frequency details and the kind of sharpness. We can maybe play around with some sharpening features and stuff like that. Yeah, you can see the edges look a bit more harder and more natural there, perhaps. What might also work is just for this to be larger. We scale this down to 100 by 100. Let's try back to our crazy big image. Maybe having that being like almost twice as big. I'm playing around with the alpha again to get the get it white on a transparent background. That looks interesting. Ah, okay, we've kind of got a, like a cartoony effect here, right? Because it's very uh, well-defined kind of steps on this outer border. Maybe we can tweak that a bit more to be a bit less extreme. all sorts of stuff we could do right like we could overlay this with a softer kind of blurred version give us a bit of like spread to this but then still have this more well defined version on top We're kind of getting to the point now where this is very much like an artistic thing and having an artist actually produce some custom brushes for this purpose I think would give us kind of nicer results. There is a weird effect, I don't know if that video compression is and I think you see this, but there's this kind of speckly thing around the outside. I suspect that's because this image probably contains, merge this down, probably contains some stray pixels around the edge. It kind of just clean that stuff out. Run this again. Okay, this is interesting. We, you know, we've got something to work with here. Maybe the next thing to try is to add another territory here with a different color and try and see how these things blend together on the fringe. Because if you remember, with this kind of cool effect here, which was specifically something we were hoping to replicate. So, in fact, let me steal this color and use this now for our. Oh, use this now for our first territory, and we'll make the other one. 
match this blue colour. Okay, so we're getting to a point now where I'm going to be adding a second territory, so a lot of these free-floating variables I've got out here now really deserve to be um, packaged out into their own structures or classes or something, so I think maybe a good next step for me to clean this up a bit is to get a class to contain this. This is cowboy coding, so we're just going to fill it with a load of public variables. Treat this like an old school struct pretty much. Um, let's have the border points. Okay. I get rid of a load of this stuff here and move it into some extra objects here. Let's just make a list of these. I think we'll be able to, I was just considering that, do I need to create a separate overlay? render target for each territory. I think we can just do them one by one and then kind of blend them on top of each other. Should probably work just fine. First territory. We'll do the second. We need to set the color for this. Based on that other color from the image. So it is bluey color. typing there. We will also need, now need to create a mask and define the points for the second territory. Do the mask first. A separate image. 
you know, you need a fairly a fairly laborious task of noting down the coordinates of all these points again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Start at. Let's see my. Yeah, I have just realized I've been typing it into the wrong place and overwriting all of these, but I'll do some copy and paste magic, hopefully, to fix this shortly. Thank God for undo, eh? Two, three. Okay, we've now got our territories. And now we just need to tweak our code here to kind of repeat this whole process for each territory. So maybe now's a good time to pull this out into a function. Why the heck not? Same time. What do you do with some comments here? Just don't need to have T in the name anymore, they're already part of a territory class. Um, okay, maybe this debug drawing should run separately.
a debug code as well. We probably don't even need this anymore to be honest, but... Well, of refactoring just happened, but fundamentally, I don't think we really changed anything. Let's take a look. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'll compare this to our reference. Okay, so what have we got right? So we've got this kind of... The saturation seems pretty low. I can probably just tweak the alpha to improve that. Um, we are getting the right color on these fringes, right? They're planning to make this kind of purple color. Again, I think if I bump up the alpha of these, it may result in a more rich and saturated border there. We could probably play around as well with trying to make this fringy area a little bit thinner. The way to do that, I think, would be to... Um, a couple of ways I can think of. So we could make our border brush smaller so that they overlap less. We could define our points like slightly inside this area so that it doesn't it spill out quite so far. But you know, I think for the most part we've achieved mostly what we'd like to here. Let's let's try and get a couple of these tweaks in. Oh alpha, how does that look? You know one thing we also haven't done is the rotation of those kind of border pieces, so that's another thing we should maybe look into. How do we achieve that? Let's see what processing gives us in terms of functionality for rotating. Can we just draw an image outright that's been rotated? No, so it looks like we can specify the width and the height, but in order to rotate it, we're going to need to do something more fancy. Okay, so it looks like in order to get this to work, so I'm anticipating, right, that if we, we may run into some issues with origins and stuff like that so if for example we're trying to draw our border brush here and we want to kind of just rotate this by default it's kind of going to rotate around the origin around zero zero here if i just tell this to rotate by a certain number, number of degrees it's going to start drawing it like around like this let's just prove to myself that that's actually the case here Assume this is in radians. Yep. Oh, in fact, I need to just do. Yeah, as you can see, these, <laughs> these things are all over the shop right now. So I kind of need to do some re-orienting with respect to the origin in order to get these to rotate properly. Probably the way to do this is to use some the functions that processing provides for kind of saving and restoring the transformation position. So this is kind of complicated, so I'm just gonna uh, just gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and do this. Assuming this works, I'll then explain exactly what's happening here afterwards.
Uh, apparently not. Everything's getting drawn up in the top left there. Ready to rotate. What happens here? I'm missing something here. I'm sure people are screaming at the screen right now. I wonder if it's because I'm using this 3D translation function. Okay, that's what it is. I was mixing up kind of the 2D and 3D modes of processing there, I think. So, kind of an odd quirk that I feel like that should have just worked, but you know, sometimes you have to you know, learn and deal with the quirks of the software tool that you're using. Okay, what I've probably done here is put the rotate and the translate in the wrong <laughs> sequence. Okay, there we go, that looks better. So what have I just done there? So actually what I've done is I've used some kind of matrix operations here to achieve the effect of rotating this uh, brush image every time I've drawn it by a random amount because the draw image function by default doesn't really allow you to specify a rotation. If I go back to our original thing here. What I've done effectively is we wanted to draw a brush here but have it rotated. So I've used this function to uh, essentially what we're doing is we're drawing it at the origin and then translating it to where it needs to go. Which means that we can apply the rotation, which by default is kind of relative to this origin, to then get our little brush image facing in, you know, whatever random direction we wanted to. And then we translate it all the way to its kind of ultimate position, so that we get the effect of drawing the brush where we want it and having it rotated to however we wanted. Um, pick the rotation. We did a random number between 0 and pi. That's because if you're familiar with your radians, the way that radian angles work is that rather than 360 degrees, you have 2 pi degrees in a full circle. That's 90 degrees is pi by 2 pi, pi, you know, 1.5 pi and then 2 pi. So I think at this point we're about ready to stop. We've kind of achieved this effect and right now it's just a case of tweaking these variables. There are a few ways you could extend this if any of you feel like playing around with this yourselves. I think a really obvious one is right now we only have one image each for the middle brush and for the, uh, the border brush. You can instead have a whole set of these like different variant brushes and kind of every time you plop one down you randomly pick one from a set which gives you a whole load of more variation built in. You know, some of these could be softer, some of these could be harder and more textured, and I think that would really allow you to push the effect a lot further in terms of, you know, artistic creative control and ultimately realism, if that's what you're 
going for. But this basic principle, I think, is going to prove itself out as something which would work. Yeah. But thanks everyone for watching, and I will say goodbye until next time.